March webinar. My name is Faye Augustine, and I'm an Associate Director with American Rivers. I'd like to welcome you all to our March presentation, Green Infrastructure and the Element of Water. I'm really excited that you are all here to join us. A couple of quick things before we get started with the presentation today. As always, if your connection is lost, please feel free to log back in with your unique web link and passcode that was provided to you when you registered with GoToWebinar. Additionally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on April 3rd at our Blue Trails Guide, bluetrailsguide.org backslash blog. Difficulties that you can't resolve yourself, my contact information is at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to shoot me an email. does have a little bit of a lag time, so be patient um, as we are moving through the presentation. Final slide. Finally, um, we encourage asking all of the questions during um, the webinar. So as you all know, there is a question box in your GoToWebinar side panel. We encourage you to ask your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll save about five minutes at the end of this webinar presentation to answer as many questions as we can. And those questions that are not answered will be after, will be answered after the webinar. This final transcript of all questions and answers will be answered, will be available on April 3rd at bluechildsguide.org backslash blog. And without further ado, I want to introduce my colleague, Gary Bellin, who is located in America Rivers, Washington, D.C. office to talk with us about green infrastructure and the element of water. Gary, I'll turn it over to you. All right, well, thank you, everybody, and thank you for having me uh, talk at this uh, regular webinar series. Um, and uh, I'm the director, senior director of the Clean Water Supply Program at American Rivers. Um, that is the, uh, our mission is to maintain and restore natural hydrology um, in, uh, to and in rivers, particularly as it regards to impacts in areas. Um, we focus primarily on uh, management issues. And you'll see a little bit of how that works into this. Um, now, I think I can, uh, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with American Rivers, uh, our background, and the variety of different work that we do. Um, and one of the sort of connecting tissues for a lot of the work that we do in our different programs and regional offices are about establishing resilience for rivers and streams uh, and hydrology in the face of a changing climate. And uh, by resilience, we, we, uh, there are a variety of different ways you achieve resilience. Uh, one is increasing natural land cover. Um, one is lowering total water consumption. And uh, the third is improving water infrastructure. Um, and so these all kind of link back and forth to each other. Now, when you're dealing with blue trails and much of what Faye and her team works on, natural land cover is a very important um, aspect of, uh, of, this, um, of this triad uh, of resilience. Um, for the Clean Water Supply Program, water consumption and improving water infrastructure are two pieces that we take very seriously in, in completing that triad of achieving resilience for our rivers in the face of a changing climate. Um, so one of the uh, uh, stories I like to tell about stormwater and, and wastewater and how they impact things and, and why it's important to do green infrastructure, which is a more nature-based uh, approach to, to water management. Um, this is a video. It's, it's not working on this particular uh, medium, but uh, my wife and I took a honeymoon a number of years ago to, uh, to Greece, and we were uh, touring the Parthenon and, and seeing all the ancient structures. When I came across this, this, uh, this little thing right here, and I found out that this was actually uh, a stormwater um, conveyance channel, basically. And Um, the way is, is no different, really, than it was back in ancient Greek times. We have pipes um, <clears throat> that try and take as possible off the land and distribute it into the stream or river as quickly as possible. Take as much water, and whatever pollutant happens to be in it gets taken with it. Um, and so this becomes more and more important in an urban area when you look at how much development occurs. One of the biggest impacts of urban areas on our, our natural hydrology and on our streams and rivers is the 
um, covering up of natural soil um, and permeable surfaces with impermeable surfaces. So as you see here in this, uh, this chart, in a natural setting, 40% uh, of your water is evapotranspired, 10% is surface runoff, 25% goes to shallow infiltration, which is very important for regular uh, stream and river flows, and then 25% goes into deep infiltration. And as you see, as you go um, have more and more development, more and more impermeable land cover, um, you get less and less of that shallow infiltration, much less of that deep infiltration, and you get a lot more of that surface runoff, 55% as opposed to 10% there. And what that means is all that water is heading into local streams and rivers or, depending on where you live, into your sewage treatment plant at really high volumes and rates and, and uh, fairly polluted. Um, and so it really messes up the natural uh, hydrology. So, um, and as you can see, as development uh, rates are currently outpacing um, population growth, so that means despite a, a steady or even population growth, our development is increasing, increasing at a much higher rate. And with that, our um, impaired waters um, are becoming more and more degraded. So let's talk a little bit about what natural hydrology. <clears throat> so here's a, uh, in, uh, in, in, what I mean by engineering uh, parlance, here's a, a hydrograph. This shows you the rate of um, volume of water discharging, um, uh, entering a, a stream over time um, in, a, uh, in a rural and urban environment. So the green represents rural, and this is, or a natural setting. So as you can see, as it rains, water kind of slowly ramps up evens out a little bit and slowly ramps down again in terms of how it r reaches the, the river. In an urban environment, which is the, the yellow line, you can see how much just enters in a very, very quick time, um, and that has massive impacts. Um, these impacts and, uh, um, are more frequent flooding, uh, increased flood peaks, and, uh, and believe it or not, lower base flow because you're covering up this, uh, the recharge areas. All the water is flows through the river very quickly, and then there's not enough shallow water to refill your rivers or, uh, or provide a base flow. Groundwater. So that's why green infrastructure, green stormwater infrastructure, is such a critical component of any river protection uh, strategy, um, particularly ones that are close to urban or suburban environments. Um, they, uh, urban suburban environments are in the watershed and they have a massive impact on those on those waters entering uh, rivers and so you know we have a philosophy of restoring protecting and replicating natural uh, infrastructure natural systems in order to uh, provide a, the most natural hydrology possible to our our impacted rivers um, and this has been backed up by the Natural Research Council um, it's a at the Environmental Protection Agency, a number of universities have all shown um, that these uh, different methods, action aids, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, are all uh, are scientifically sound approaches um, to creating a more natural uh, water-based system for uh, urban and suburban water bodies. So, can I go backwards? So we can skip that. A little bit more technical right here. Um, what I do want to get at is um, what a green roof does to, to your hydrograph. So a normal, um, in an urban environment, the red dashed line shows a normal roof response. You get a lot of rain falling on it. It runs off very quickly and enters the stream, and you can see you get that massive discharge really fast and dumps into that, uh, into your uh, your water bottle charge really body. The green roof, that, what does that look like? That looks very familiar. It looks exactly like our natural hydrograph. So you can see a, a built green roof has a very similar hydrograph to your, your natural system. So the more green roofs or rain gardens, permeable pavement that we can build, the more we mimic natural hydrology in an urban and suburban setting. So, um, for the purposes of river recreation, what you really want to see is how this impacts uh, groundwater, because your shallow groundwater flow is what gives you your, 
you're setting even base flow to your, your stream. And so a Los Angeles study um, found a potential of up to 40% of precipitation could, you, could be used for recharge on the first three quarters inch of rainfall. So um, that's 570,000, for those of you out west, it's 578,000 acre feet per year, per year. And so it's not an insignificant amount of water that we're either keeping out of the groundwater flow or could be using um, for that recharge. So here's where we start to get into the different um, best management practices, um, or you might, uh, BMPs, or you might also call them stormwater control measures, SCM practices, um, that uh, encompass green stormwater infrastructure. And the first and the most popular is bioretention. Uh, and, um, uh, they can be constructed in a, a variety of different ways. Um, bioretention because you're using soil and plants to, um, to hold and infiltrate uh, water. So in this picture here, you can see it's a, uh, it's a garden and it has very, uh, very nice, um, uh, it's a garden community benefits in terms of the way it looks and aesthetics, um, but it also provides a very engineered solution. You can see the curb cut. Um, close here, so when the stormwater comes in, it rolls in here rather than going straight storm drain. And this soil uh, is typically a particular soil mix, especially to a slants are um, taken, uh, used to infiltrate water and hold water as, um, in, as best uh, in the necessarily engineered uh, So um, the plants um, Do, uh, do help a lot in there uh, as engineers and uh, research facilities are doing more looking, they're finding that plants play uh, a pretty critical role, particularly from a pollution perspective. They break down a lot of those heavy metals and oils um, along with the first soil of, uh, layer of soil. Um, but the soils are really what's helping hold that water and infiltrating it. Um, and one thing that I don't mention here, which you'll probably, if you really get into this, um, particular topic, you'll hear more about internal water storage. And so in a lot of these bioretention cases, they have under drains built underneath them to allow for a really heavy rainfall um, so flooding doesn't occur. Um, and uh, what, well, what we used to do in engineering practice is we would just have a straight under drain and this water would kind of go out to the system back into storm uh, sewer rather than having enough time to infiltrate. So um, internal water storage was basically just a a term for having an S curve in your pipe, uh, your under drain pipe, to, um, so the water would not drain out as fast. It would have to wait there in a little bit and build up to a certain level before it would be allowed to, to exit the system. And that would allow the water to infiltrate more into your shallow groundwater flows and give it more of a chance to reaching the river. So here a couple examples. Uh, the one below, I believe, is uh, in Portland. The one above here is a rain garden um, in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And there are a variety of different uh, cost uh, perspectives and, um, and uh, shapes and functions that you can do with bioinfiltration. Bioswales are very similar. The difference is um, where bioinfiltration uh, works to ma maximize water infiltrating into the, the soil. Swales are very focused on moving that water to a different level to bio, uh, bioinfiltration uh, system. And so right here you see a uh, location. Perhaps uh, an example of a bioswale in a parking lot. You see there are no curbs in the parking lot, so the water can flow right off um, the surface into this uh, area, and then it will flow down into a, an infiltration area. In the meantime, the plants and the soils here allow a certain amount of pollutants to settle out, um, be um, uh, taken up by biological processes in the soil, and then the water itself will then uh, go to another system that will allow it to infiltrate. And you can see for bioinfiltration and for bioswales, we, we're not talking about standing water. We're talking about water that infiltrates very quickly or flows along. And so after um, a storm comes through, um, you, any standing water there should be should disappear uh, between 12 to 24 hours if there is any standing water. If it's designed and built correctly, I should know, there shouldn't be any. Now we have had situations where people drive trucks over them, the soil gets compacted, and you no longer get that water infiltration. Um, so that has to be uh, 
you look for and make sure that these are built properly, but there should be no standing water. And that eliminates the primary concern many people have had with these in the past, which is mosquitoes. These things, you should have no mosquitoes. In fact, they're, in some ways, they are a mosquito control um, measure. Mosquitoes need about 72 hours to uh, 36 to 72 hours to, to hatch once the eggs have been laid. These things uh, drain within 12 to 20. So any um, mosquito larvae that might be deposited are, are uh, eradicated due to the process. Um, filter strips uh, are, uh, don't convey water, don't hold water. They, their primary um, function is to filter water out and slow it down before reaching something like a bioinfiltration um, cell or a, or a, filter, or a bio, uh, bio swale. So um, pretty when you have large parking lots, you see this one right up here, you have a lot of we call sheet flow, like flowing water coming off in large amounts off the, uh, the parking lot evenly. And uh, when you have it at that speed or that volume, if you let it go into your bioretention cell or your uh, bioswale, it can um, tear up the grass. It can provide, create erosion. So you have a filter strip here made up of um, a little bit of uh, stone right here and then uh, grass and maybe some uh, little some other shrubs before you get to the, uh, the swale or the infiltration cell right here. And that slows it down, lets some pollutants filter out, cools it down a little bit, and uh, creates a more even entry of the water into the system. So, now, permeable paving is, is one, of my, uh, one of my favorites uh, in this. Um, it, it's, it's basically when you have typical pavement, whether it be concrete or asphalt, um, they have a variety of different sized stones um, to, to create it. And oftentimes sand or small stones are added to make it a solid impermeable surface. Well, permeable paving uh, is basically the same except you take out those small stones or that sand and allow the water to infiltrate through the permeable pavement. Um, and so it's a pretty uh, neat um, material. Um, and can be used in a lot of different places. Now, it, there's a little bit of an art to, to creating the permeable concrete or permeable. It can be um, quality control, can be a little uh, tricky depending on who, you, how much experience your asphalt or installer has. So a lot of people have been now turning to uh, permeable pavers, which are pre-constructed um, stone infiltration systems that um, a, a certified installer can come and install. And basically you have um, these Stones, or, um, they come in a variety of soft and shapes and designs for architectural um, purposes. And they all have cracks throughout them. And they put specialized stone in between. And so the rain then falls through those cracks and into a specialized designed um, layer underneath that filters and uh, holds the water and then lets it go back into the uh, groundwater system. Uh, and these can be put in pretty quickly. Uh, quality control is very high because of the uh, the standardization of installation. Um, so permeable paving, you see there are a variety of applications. This whole basketball court uh, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is permeable pavement. Um, and this was another video uh, up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, this is a uh, water truck that was uh, just pouring gallons and gallons of water on this uh, permeable pavement, uh, permeable paper system. And it was just all soaking it up just like that. Um, so their permeable pavers are great, great for low speed environments, great for more urban areas, parking lots. They're not good for high speed roads. Um, they're still um, not, can't withstand the, the rigors of high speed travel. Um, and they also do need to be maintained on a fairly regular basis. You don't want them to get clogged up. Um, so uh, vacuum trucks can be used um, in some of these cases. That's another reason a lot of people like the permeable pavers because um, uh, when if they do get clogged up, it's much less permeable expensive to pull the stone out and just replace it. Um, but even if they do get uh, clogged up, they still find that they they have um, provide a certain amount of infiltration. Um, it's just slower, and uh, and they still work fairly effectively. Um, and they're uh, they're a great practice for more urban environments. In fact, places like Chicago, uh, Lancaster, Milwaukee. Um, Portland, Oregon, uh, have all worked to put in uh, permeable pavement alleys and uh, parking lots in a variety of different places. So 
whole category of best management practices uh, where they use uh, trees and their root systems and soils to collect water from stormwater and filter it out and, out and slow it down before going into your normal stormwater system. So it's not necessarily getting water into uh, groundwater flows. It is still going into a normal stormwater system, but it does provide water quality treatment purposes and does slow it down a little bit um, uh, to, uh, to provide a little bit of magic, some natural hydrology. hydrology. Um, infiltration trenches, they differ from bioinfiltration in that they're much larger and uh, they don't necessarily have to have uh, a um, specialized soil and have larger stone when not. Their whole focus is just to have water go straight into the ground. They can have brown water. Um, and so as you can see, the drainage area of up to two acres or less um, is a much larger size than your typical bioinfiltration system. Um, and like I said, uh, focus is to just uh, shoot water into the groundwater system. They're much larger, tend to be um, much less engineered. Uh, they're uh, moving on to the next slide. Stormwater wetlands, some people consider this a green infrastructure, green stormwater infrastructure, some don't. Um, some, um, because rather than being um, a, a rather um, um, small, discrete um, uh, method like you would find in a garden or a permeable pavement, it's a much, much larger system. Um, in a rain dome and focused on uh, much larger drainage areas. Um, however, uh, stormwater wetlands uh, are much more, tend to be one of the most effective ways of combating um, nutrient pollution, nitrogen, because of the biological processes that they have. Um, and so as you can see, um, the drainage area here is the largest of all the, these systems we've had so far at five to 10 acres. Um, but again, when you have something this large, uh, siding can be a concern. How much room do you actually have? Um, and uh, and also, you do have, typically have standing water uh, in, in these systems. Um, so they can be a public amenity in neighborhoods, and there are a variety of neighborhoods that have these installed for that particular purpose. Um, but again, you typically have standing water. It takes up a large amount of land. But it is one of the more effective nutrient um, best management practices that we have. Um, and then uh, green streets. These are basically you have combinations of a variety of different uh, things that I just went over. You have, um, in this particular example from Portland, uh, technique, you have bioinfiltration cells uh, here where these trees are with curb cuts. Um, they, they, uh, they uh, up above the street, you have these um, linked together as a swale, so the water uh, comes in through a, a small uh, Infiltration strip um, to slow it down, filter it out. It enters into a variety of swales, filtration um, that are linked into the system of, uh, of tree boxes, and they're all linked underneath this concrete here. So the water can flow, it can infiltrate down, and then they typically have one um, at the base that's uh, larger that'll pr uh, provide any uh, residual in infiltration that is uh, needed. Um, they can be used just on the side of the street like this. A lot of times they're used as uh, bump outs um, to create traffic calming. Um, and so it, uh, the transportation community has really kind of taken these into account when they work with their stormwater programs and departments um, to both get a stormwater water quality benefit um, along with traffic calming and, um, and community amenity uh, placement. And then uh, green roofs, we talked about green roofs. Uh, they're becoming more and more popular in different parts of the country. Portland has a strong program. Washington, D.C. has um, typically complete, competes with Portland and uh, Chicago for having the largest acreage um, of roofs uh, in the country. This particular one is taken in Grand Rapids, Michigan, of green roof, which for a time had the largest um, uh, square footage of green roof per capita in the country, um, thanks to some um, uh, foundations uh, based there that allowed for their um, uh, construction and promoted them. So, and they can provide nice, uh, nice recreational, not recreational, but areas for um, breaks and things of that nature. And they uh, they hold up. Now they do need a specialized um, gravel uh, and soil system because it needs to be lighter weight because you're putting this on top of a building. 
there are uh, a variety of different products. It's not just the heavy, big green roofs that have trees in them. Um, there are uh, a lot of them are lightweight plants, uh, sedums. If you're familiar with things like stone crop, uh, are very popular because they're lightweight and can in the harsh environment of a roof. Um, but they have uh, some companies have rollout mats of this. Some uh, withstand uh, companies have tray systems. There are a whole variety um, an industry around different green roof products that fit just about any uh, type of system. And they, these are all about the same weight for for larger buildings in the city where we have stone that's put up on um, on the roofs as what they call roof ballast to uh, protect the the roofing material there. Green roofs actually are about uh, the same weight as that. Uh, these days, and they also provide uh, typically double the, the life of your roof because of the added protection they, uh, they give it. So you can actually have cost savings and energy efficiency because they lower uh, action that they uh, heat loss. Um, they provide some cooling for the building, and they uh, extend the life of your roof. So there are a lot of um, while it's a bit more expensive than your typical roof, uh, prices are coming down, and there are a lot of added other economic benefits from ha uh, for your building from having them installed. Um, so the economics of green infrastructure, I um, won't get into this too much, it, they are generally less expensive to install than conventional new uh, infrastructure, um, like pipes. They, uh, you have to do less, fewer pipes and smaller diameter pipes, um, so they um, uh, that cost less money. One thing they're starting to find is that the, the maintenance, depending on what you're doing, uh, what kind of green infrastructure you're installing, can be a little bit more um, uh, just in terms of uh, maintaining landscaping over time. Um, um, a lot of people are doing studies now in terms of how you integrate your green infrastructure management with typical landscaping management to save on costs and training. Um, but uh, they are competitive with traditional green, uh, stormwater control measures. And you see in our pretty major cities now, like uh, Atlanta, uh, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, just about every one, you'll find some area where they're starting to use these, uh, one of these uh, variety of options in their storm management. Um, and then water. And just talking about, this slide got a lot of place, just talking about the cooling benefits of green roofs. Um, this is Chicago City Hall. You can see the green roof that was installed on the left and the typical roof that was on the right. And you can see the heat differential between the two. I mean. We're talking um, like uh, 50 degrees or more um, difference in uh, in the summertime. So you can imagine the health benefits from associated with green infrastructure. Um, so as we get down to the, the bottom of the, the hour, and I got to um, start to, to finish up, just to wrap you to a variety of tools and publications that are out there that can show the variety of different benefits beyond just water quality management that you can get from green green infrastructure. A um, number of years ago, American Rivers, uh, with the Center for Neighborhood Technology, um, developed a, a, a toolkit to help calculate the variety of different benefits available. And there are a variety of different uh, institutions now, like the Water Environment and Reuse Foundation, that are looking at all the co-benefits that you get from green infrastructure, from just uh, decreased uh, water um, cleaning, um, everything costs to uh, community health benefit, um, carbon uh, dioxide um, uh, reduction for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's just a much more dynamic engineered system than your traditional stormwater or wastewater um, conveyance. You get a lot more benefit because of the, of the nature of the design fit out of it. Um, and, uh, and you can see uh, places like Philadelphia that have really bought into this. They, they, did a triple bottom line analysis looking at the different benefits, um, both environmental, economic, and social. Um, they found added recreational use, energy savings, improved air quality, fewer heat-related fatalities. Um, and so they're really, if you look at just the economics, you get some balance, but it's not until you really look at the environmental and social benefits that you get from these that you really see the, 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 the true benefits um, from using this particular type of system. And so for that matter, uh, for that reason, the city of Philadelphia um, is required by law to reduce their combined sewer overflows. Um, and they need to do this by reducing the amount of stormwater that enters their, their wastewater pipes. And most 
cities that have done this in the past have committed to building giant deep tunnel systems, which are hugely expensive um, and take a long time to build. And so Philadelphia is attempting the approach of using an entirely green infrastructure system to, uh, to solve the problem rather than a deep uh, tunnel system because they believe that rather than just spending a ton of money on just a big concrete pipe underneath the ground, they can spend that same amount of money or perhaps less on green stormwater infrastructure, they'll get a lot more social environmental benefit out of their investment. And so they have a, um, a, a vision of uh, this is what Philadelphia looks now, and uh, they've already started to, to move this vision. So some areas have already started to be built out, but this is what they kind of envision for the city of Philadelphia. Move forward on it eventually. And you can see, kind of going back to what we were talking about before about natural hydrology and more natural system, we truly are trying to make the urban environment uh, look more natural, act more natural in terms of, of water. Or as I like to say, uh, we're trying to get our cities to act more like forests. Um, so here's a little bit more about the dollars and cents. So Philadelphia did a calculation about the green act, uh, option uh, providing um, something like $2.8 billion in benefits um, whereas the gray option only gives you $122 million in benefits. And New York City had um, uh, similar uh, calculations gone out for similar studies that they did. And, uh, and just I'll finish up here with a slight, uh, small case study from Milwaukee. We've done quite a bit of work in that city um, with uh, Green Roofs, and they've committed to, um, they have a deep uh, tunnel system to handle a, uh, extra stormwater that gets into their combined sewer systems. And as a result, they have two to three massive sewage overflows every year, um, and even with the deep tunnel system. And so uh, they're committed to um, eradicating those deep uh, those sewage overflows completely with green infrastructure. Um, and so as you can see, they've started to put in green roofs um, and permeable pavement, rain barrel programs. They have a variety of grant programs, and they've also so implemented a, a stormwater fee program uh, to raise money. So the more perm impermeable pavement you have, the higher a fee you pay. So if you go and install green infrastructure on your own, you can actually get out and underneath this, um, this fee system. And uh, it, it helps incentivize um, the, um, uh, the implementation of uh, green infrastructure in that city. So with that, we're at 133 Faye. Um, that's the entirety of my presentation at this point in time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gary, for your um, excellent presentation, and thanks all for participating um, in this presentation as well. So if you have not yet um, asked your question, feel free to go ahead and type it in um, the question box. As we mentioned earlier, we will have um, a full transcript of all questions and answers that were asked during the presentation um, available on the Blue Trail Guide website on April 3rd. Um, we've got a couple of questions here lined up. So Gary, I'll probably have you answer one and then we'll answer, um, we'll have the other ones available on the website just to be mindful of time. Um, so the question was, um, you had mentioned the one resource from Center for Center for Neighborhood Technology and American Rivers. Where are other resources um, that people can go to to learn more about um, ways to implement green infrastructure or how to start um, planning for green infrastructure in their community? Sure. <clears throat> so uh, American Rivers has a, um, a, a uh, resource center on our web page uh, called the, the Integrated Water Management Resource Center. So some of our publications and resources are available there. Um, we're still um, updating that. Um, also, and actually I haven't gone to check to see if it's still there since the change in administration, but um, EPA has a great resource center, um, epa.gov slash green infrastructure. Um, they were collecting all the varieties of um, resources around green stormwater infrastructure from implementation, design, to, uh, to um, economic benefits and costs. So uh, I recommend uh, checking uh, checking those two uh, out. And um, it, depending on where you live, your local sewage utility, uh, wastewater utility, stormwater, they may have their own resources for local initiatives uh, going on. So I encourage uh, looking them up as well. Excellent. Um, and then I guess one final question to, to uh, round out our half hour together. Um, if 
if you wanted to find more information about the benefits of green infrastructure, particularly around kind of recreation opportunities, are you aware of any studies that are um, available or organizations that have pulled together information about that? Um, that's a really good question. And I, um, I think that the two that probably have, if there are studies that exist for that, they would be in the city of Philadelphia or the city of Portland, Oregon. Um, those, uh, those two cities have done some of the most extensive uh, research on, um, on those benefits. And I know Philadelphia in particular was looking at the recreational uh, benefits. So um, that's where I would, I would start. But I'd have to go look and, and potentially respond to that after having had a chance to, to, to look a little bit more. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gary. And with it being um, 11.36 Mountain Time, um, we are past our half hour point. So I wanted to say thank you to everyone for participating in our March webinar series. And Gary, thank you again for your really great presentation on um, green stormwater infrastructure. Um, just so everybody knows, this is going to be the first in a couple of series that we'll be having on green infrastructure moving forward um, over the next couple of months. So stay tuned um, to learn more about how um, you can to integrate green infrastructure into your community and recreation planning. Um, thank you all again, and we'll see you in April.